so you all know what city, the city different is, right? What is it? That's right. I even Googled it because I'd heard that, but I was like, if I put the city different, will it say Santa Fe? Well, sure enough, it does. <laughs> we in Santa Fe, Santa Fe is the city different. That is the proclamation, and I believe it to be true. And following in that vein, uh, we are the church different, with I think the minister different. And why not have an Easter different, right? So most of you, I would imagine, have heard the story of Easter many times, have had different experiences and expressions. And uh, so we're going to start off with a different expression. So, so, you know, you can't help it. My inner children say, can we have ears? I'm like, heck yeah. So, there was a man driving down the road. And there was a rabbit hopping across the road. And he swerved to avoid missing the rabbit. However, he heard a thump. So, he pulled over the car and he checked on the rabbit. And oh my God, the rabbit was dead. He was horrified. And he started to cry. And a woman driving her car saw him and pulled over and said, Sir, what's the matter? And he goes, oh, I tried not to hit the rabbit, but I hit it and it's dead. And the woman looked at him and said, Don't worry, I know what to do. So she goes to her car, opens up the trunk, grabs a, a spray can, goes over to the dead rabbit, sprays the entire contents of the can onto the rabbit, and miraculously, suddenly, the rabbit jumps up, waves its paw, and hops down the road. But 50 yards later, it turns and waves again. It hops more, turns, and waves again. And this continued. And the man's like, what was in that spray can? And she took the can and turned it around, and it said... Hairspray restores hair, de um, dead hair to life. <laughs> and adds permanent wave. Okay, so how many times... <laughs> Whew, got that out of the way. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to take these off for the moment, only because... You know, I, I don't know. I would just look at myself and just laugh the entire time, which is good because laughter is really good for us. So, Easter. Okay. Besides rabbits and eggs and candy, oh my. <clears throat> the Easter we celebrate today is a blend of paganism and uh, Christianity and Judaism. It's secular and it's religious. Some of you may know this, but the word Easter is derived from Ostere or Ostara, an ancient Anglo-Saxon goddess. She symbolized the rebirth of day and the return of life in the spring. So the arrival of spring was celebrated long before Christianity came and any religious meaning was associated with Easter. So as Christianity grew and spread, throughout the world, it was a common practice to adopt the pagan and the secular traditions with the Christian theology. And because Astori was the goddess of spring and her symbolism dealt with renewal and death, it was easy to plant the resurrection of Christ into the mix. So traditional Christians, um, Easter is that commemoration of the ordeal, the trial, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of the man named Jesus. Easter, as it's celebrated today, is one-third passion play and two-thirds miracle. It's a story about the raw suffering, emotional and physical suffering of one man whose only crime was to bring truth, teachings, and love to a world that was racked with violence and ignorance and hatred. Kind of sounds like some of our world today. Just saying, this simple Jewish man, K 
came with the mission to bring light and truth and teachings that people didn't understand the universal life teachings. I believe he spent some time probably in that missing years of his story in India, learning from the yogis things that we weren't being taught or they weren't being taught because it was all about control of the Roman government and such. So Easter is an allegory for the rebirth of releasing the old. And for me, that's releasing the body, but the body of limited thinking. We've all been conditioned and domesticated, as Don Maguire Ruiz would say, by thoughts of that we're sinners. Okay, and you have to believe in Jesus in order to be saved. Uh, I think that was a control thing myself, personally. We're all the divine in expression. Jesus himself said, know ye not, you are gods. And greater things than I do, you can do too. And learn from my teachings, which is what we're going to go into today. So you have to, first of all, in order to raise up. And by the way, the whole story of the Bible is about the evolution of consciousness. To enter the kingdom of heaven, heaven is not some place up in the sky. It's a state of consciousness. We can have our own heaven and hell, and it's right here. I experience heaven and hell by the way I think or see or perceive things. And I can change that up, but it's the evolution of consciousness. I spoke of this last week on how we're told that we're caterpillars. And so we creep along the ground being fed all this lies and whatnot, when in truth we are all a butterfly in disguise and not knowing that. So we have to enter into that tomb which is the cocoon of transformation. Again, I spoke about this last week as Jesus entered into Jerusalem, knowing that there was something that awaited him. But it was a teaching. He's an example. He's our teacher, the great way shower. He's not the great exception that uh, many traditions tend to see. But we are all the Christ itself. Jesus was a man, Joshua, his name. What is the Christ? The Christ is that which is breathing me and you. The Christ, you can call it whatever you want to. It's the power, it's the presence, it's the I am, it's the I can see more, and I'm the butterfly that's moving about and all about the we-ness and the, and the collective oneness. And most of all, it's about I'm not separated from God or the divine. It's It's an illusion that we have been fed, that we have to kill off in order to rise up in consciousness. It is required that we crucify that which is holding us back. So Easter is about the resurrection, as you all know. And uh, so what exactly is the resurrection? Well, true story, there was a priest who called the children up to the platform on a Sunday morning, and he said, do you know what the resurrection, any of you know what the resurrection is? And one little boy said, well, I know what it is. It's when, well, he goes, I don't know for sure what it is. But if you have one for four hours, you have to go to the hospital. <laughs> okay, well... You can only tell these jokes once a year or so. <laughs> Thank God Easter only happens once. And uh, so now we've had the little boy's definition of the resurrection. Now, how about Charles Fillmore, the co-founder of Unity? What does he say? And Charles Fillmore looked at the Bible as a metaphysical symbolism, an allegory, that it's not about Jesus, it's about us. If we put ourselves into the character of every person, we can learn something about the transformation of our evolution of our consciousness so that we can rise up and do things that are greater, as Jesus himself proclaimed. So, Charles Fillmore says, Easter is the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. Its inner meaning and spiritual significance is the awakening and raising to spiritual consciousness of the divine I am in every one of us. 
that has been dead in its awareness of the truth and buried in the tomb of illusions and materiality. Yeah, that, that could be, right? Every time we rise up in the realization that I'm the divine and we're all the divine and I have a, the ability to create my life, we are all creating our life. That's what we teach in the five principles. Basically, the resurrection of Jesus or the Christ happens every time I remember that I'm the divine and so are you. And that my thoughts are creating things. That whatever my belief system is, is creating my life expression. Which is good news because I can change perhaps my beliefs. It might take some work. So the, um, the definition of resurrection is to rise up. To shift the consciousness. But it cannot happen cannot happen without the crucifixion. That which is holding us back in our thought process and what we've been trained to think and believe, which some of it's not true at all. Question your beliefs. It's scary because I like my beliefs and I'm familiar with them. But to enter into that, that's what Jesus did when he entered into Jerusalem, which means inner peace. He was willing to face his fears, identify them, and look them down and cross them out so that he could rise up and be the full, complete, divine human that um, we all are. So the resurrection is required. Charles Fillmore again says, the word crucifixion means that we are crossing out in consciousness of certain errors that have been fixed states of mind, it is the enactment by a master of the final release of the limited fear-based mind in order to that the free, unlimited butterfly Christ mind that is pure love and compassion can live and be in its complete fullness. That's what I'm signing up for. Anyone else want to sign up for that? You're right. So... Again, for you, for me, to be resurrected, I need to identify what my fears are and my hidden beliefs. Because if I don't do that work and cross them out and create a new belief, I used to think that money causes misery. And uh, that was a four-year-old who adopted that thought looking at my parents. It doesn't, that money doesn't cause misery. It was neutral. But I saw my parents, my dad going for money, and mom was miserable, and I was like, well, I don't want to be miserable. Subconsciously, I was blocking out having money. I don't want to be miserable. This is stuff that goes on, and we don't even know it. It's underneath the surface. That's why I need to bring to light, and that's what I do in spiritual counseling, is work and find the limiting beliefs and then change them. So I changed money causes misery to money is neutral. That's a lot more true. And then I thought, well, if I can attach a lower uh, vibrational belief to money, why don't I go for a higher vibration of belief on money? And I said, well, the highest uh, demonstration of vibration life is love. So I said, money is green love. And, and in order to impress upon my consciousness, I went to the CVS, purchased a stamp pad with a heart, Stamped all of my checks with the heart. Money is green love. Did it that same thing in my checkbook on the register. And if you ever have a dollar bill or 20 that has a heart on it, I have no idea where that came from. <laughs> Just saying. So, Jesus, Easter is not Jesus' story. It's a story about a man who said, came and said, I'm going to teach and hopefully some people will catch the teachings. And part of the crucifixion, there's seven phrases that Jesus apparently said on the cross. And each of them is a nugget of truth and a practice for me. It's a practice for you. I can see you're all ready to take notes. Should have handed out notepads at the beginning. But you can re-listen to this. So there are seven phrases, and I'm going to cover those seven phrases with you now. And what that means to you because otherwise it's just a story but it's my story and how what did Jesus want me to get from his teaching and it's a blueprint on how to 
shift and evolve my consciousness from that, um, from that caterpillar to a butterfly. So there are seven days of the week and there are seven phrases. This is also part of how you could do a practice. You're going, okay, Monday. What's Monday? What's the first phrase and word that the master teacher said? Well, the word is forgiveness. The phrase, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Okay? So I am not going to rise up in my consciousness unless I release my resentment, my hurt, my anger. I'm not going to rise up in consciousness while I'm carrying all that low vibration. So the first thing the Spirit um, in the man of Jesus said, forgive, let it go then you can be free. Actually, forgiveness is freedom. It's not condoning what they have done. But the line that he uses is, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I like to add, they know not who they are. Those that are committing atrocious things that are hurtful are not aware of their own special divinity. People who hurt others are hurting themselves. It always breaks my heart when I hear of some shooting or some tragedy of things that are happening in our world. And I pray for comfort for those that have lost people. And I pray that those that are so lost that they would commit any hurtful crimes against others also find their way and get the help. Again, They've been brainwashed to believe in something else. So to forgive is our first key. And the Course in Miracles has a, my favorite saying probably on forgiveness. Forgiveness is removing a block in my awareness to the presence of love. I'll say that again. Forgiveness is removing a block in my awareness to the presence of of love. So you want to know how to practice forgiveness, yes? yes. Okay, I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> there are several, there is many methods of forgiveness. I also don't believe in spiritual bypass to say, oh, I forgive you. Meanwhile, I'm still ticked off and hurt. There is a, out on the vestibule in the hallway, um, a forgiveness letter. And those that are in the cyber sanctuary, you can also contact me at revliz at unitysantafe.org if you want me to send you a copy. Forgiveness letter honors and gives voice to all of your feelings. Honors your feelings. Your feelings are valid and need to have that. So you get to share your anger. You get to share your hurt. There's five areas. You get to share your fears, your regrets, and also any love or appreciation. There's little sentence stems you start with. Then the key is that you get to write a letter back from the person that hurts you and have them say to you all the things you would like to hear them say. They might have even been passed on the other side of the veil. To be able to hear a being who may not ever be able to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, I wish I'd never done that. I didn't see you. I didn't treat you well. I'm ashamed of myself. I'm embarrassed. Okay? Uh, there's nothing I can do to make up to you. All those words. Subconscious does not know what's real or not. This is a practice that has freed me from so many times that I have stuff around somebody else. I don't want to carry around that weight. I want freedom. So I do the work. And then it's really good also to share that letter with someone that you trust, like your minister, perhaps. Um, because it's nice to have validation of that and witnessed by another who doesn't do anything except love you as you share those feelings. So that's one way. And the other thing is just to remember, they, are, they have forgotten who they are. Okay, so that's Monday. A lot of work on Mondays. Tuesday, we are now going to the word now. Truly, uh, um, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Okay, he's talking to the two thieves on both sides of him. The word is now. See, paradise cannot 
be experienced except in the now. Today is the key word. Because on both sides, there is the past and the future. And when I'm stuck in either one of them, they rob me. They rob me from the power and the joy of living in the now. We can have past memories, but I don't want to get stuck there. I don't want to get stuck in my past and fears, doubts, and worries on this side of things that haven't happened. That's taking me out of the now. And now is where the paradise, the joy is. So not to be robbed from either side. And the way to enter into that today is to say, I am here now. Say that. Again. One more time. Now. now that was easy, right? <laughs> so I'm here now. God is here now. Love is here now. You can say that in your head subconsciously, but it brings me back to the now. When I'm drifting into either direction, I'm here now. Breathe. Oh, that's an important part of it too. Breathe. With consciousness. All right, so now we're forgive, forgiveness and now. The next word is oneness. And that's on Wednesday, and that is, woman, behold your son, behold your mother. Now, why Jesus was supposedly saying this to his own physical mom or Mary, and then there was the disciple John, but why would he even say this? Because oneness. Oneness, that there is only one family, and it is the family of humanity, divine in every one of us. We need to release, crucify, all the roles that we have about separation. I'm not separated from any of you. I'm not separate. We're all part of that one. We're like a tapestry, all having our special colors and threads. And when I start judging somebody else, I'm creating separation. Now, Jesus also had two um, things that he was very strong about. Love others as you would love yourself. He didn't say, love Democrats, but hate those Republicans. Okay, just off the top. Don't, I, I love you, but I hate the killers. Okay? It's not the people. We hate the behaviors. That's good. But separate the person from the behavior. Okay? And to release the roles of mother and father and sister and brother and aunt and uncle and black and white and brown and, and uh, trans and non-binary and cis and uh, Asian and, and um, you name it. We have all these labels and we separate ourselves out and we want to be with our people. Well, everybody's our people. So how do we do this practice of oneness? We tell ourselves, all are divine. I am divine. I open my heart to the divine in all beings. I open my heart to the divine in all beings. I open my heart to the divine in all beings. Because I don't want to be one of those people that goes, oh, Father, forgive me, for I know not who I am or what I do. So oneness. Now we're moving to four. We're in the middle. <clears throat> this one is powerful. Father, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Anybody ever feel like God was a million miles away? I have. Heck yeah. And maybe God isn't even real, whatever my concept of God is. Okay? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Forsaken means to leave completely, to abandon, to abandon, desert. Now, Jesus, the great way shower, was saying, hey, we're all one, and God and I are one, and there's a Father within me. And yet, in his moment of the midst of this transformation, he calls out, cries out, why have you forsaken me? I love that he did this, because what he shows us is his humanity. He wasn't just up there. He was like, I feel pain, and we all feel pain. We all have that times. And if he can transform that, we can too. Mark Anthony Lord writes about this, and I'm going to, because he says it so well. God cannot and does not forsake us. I believe Jesus 
knew there was no power outside of himself, yet in the midst of fully surrendering to this truth, he demonstrated that fear can have a voice. We don't need to hide our fear, but speak it out loud. Bring it to the light. Because Jesus had faith, he could freely speak the fear of betrayal out loud. It's okay to feel forsaken when life is calling you for change. The rules you were living by yesterday no longer work, and it is scary, and it is confusing. It doesn't mean you lack faith. You only lack faith if you believe the fear to be true. Pretending you're okay when you're not feeling it will create conflicting energy, which separates you from the possibility of experiencing God Practice always speaking what you're feeling and fearing, not to give it power, but the opposite. To bring it to the light and diffuse the power. Admit where you're feeling forsaken. You can't make it go away by hiding it. <sighs> you mean I can be real? I don't have to hide my fears. You can transform anything, but you know, the truth will set you free. And there's the small T saying your truth on the level of your experience. And then there's the, the tall T truth, which is the absolute. So speak your fears. It's okay. And bring it to the light. Okay, now we've moved to Friday. We've been able to voice our fear. Now we're going into vision. The words Jesus said were, I thirst. I thirst. Thirst means to long for something to bring me comfort. I thirst for something greater than what I'm having. We all have divine discontent in our lives, places where we feel uncomfortable. And I thirst. And my question is, what are you thirsty for? What are you thirsty to have more of in your life? More joy, more peace, more love, more harmony, more of a connection with the divine that breathes, more understanding of prayer. Whatever it is, first identify what you are thirsty for. We're all thirsty and having discontent somewhere, and I want something greater. So see that, identify it, and envision it, and allow that to be what takes you through. I spoke last week about the imaginal cells in a caterpillar. The imaginal cells in a caterpillar must be activated. Your imagination has to be activated for that caterpillar to burst out of its conditioned thinking of itself into a greater expression as the butterfly. Saturday. Are we on Saturday? We're on Saturday. Whew. You know, thank God there's only seven days of the week, right? So Saturday, the word is completion. Jesus, the master, said, it is finished. It is finished. So what's not finished in your life? What is not one? For us to make movement and move forward, I have to be 100% complete with my fears, my doubts, and my worries. Whatever those are, identify those. In that garbage dump that I spoke of, that's all the garbage that we've been fed. Okay, in order to burst through all those garbage thoughts that aren't true, I need to identify them. And then what I'm going to suggest is have a ceremony. Identify what fears I have, what uh, limiting beliefs I have. Do a ceremony, a ritual, if you will. Burn it. Chop it up. Bury it. It's a ritual. I'm complete. That's gone. I'm done. Let it go. All right, now we're in Sunday. Sunday, the word is surrender. Surrender. My God, I believe he says, my um, father, I commit my spirit into your hands. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Close enough. <laughs> I, and, and so what that is, surrender. Surrender isn't, I give up. You win, I lose. No, it is the surrender because I trust and know the truth and I am free. 
It is to surrender to the truth that I am the divine in expression. And nothing and no one can stop me from rising up into that truth because it is who I am. And I'm done. And I don't fight my ego anymore. The ego has dissolved. I surrender. I trust that this is true and I accept my divinity completely, no question asked. That's the evolution in consciousness. So in closing, I have a story for you. <clears throat> Jeremy was born with a twisted body, a slow mind, and a chronic terminal illness that had been killing him all of his small life. Still, his parents tried to give him as normal a life as possible, and they sent him to St. Teresa's Elementary School. Well, at age 12, he was still in second grade, basically unable to learn. He would squirm in his seat. He would grunt. He would drool. He just had a lot of challenges. And the teacher was Mrs. Doris, was Doris Miller. She was so irritated because she had all these other students that were able to learn. And she was so frustrated by him that she called the parents in and said, you know, it's really not fair. I think you should send him to a special school because he just can't keep up with them. And his mom started to cry. Mrs. Forrester started to cry. And the dad said, well, truth is, there's no special school around here, and Jamie, Jeremy would be devastated. He loves it here. And so they left, and she's looking out the window, watching the snow and feeling just so cold and frustrated, not knowing what to do. And then she says, oh, my gosh, they have to deal with a terminally ill son. And her empathy went out and said, okay, I'm, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do better with Jeremy. So she's tried to ignore his stares and his noises. And uh, that's how it went. And then spring was coming. And she was teaching about Easter, Jesus' story, and about the renewal of new life. So she gave everyone a plastic egg and said, your homework assignment is tonight, find something that represents new life and put it in the egg and then bring it in tomorrow. You all understand? Yes, ma'am, yes, yes, yes. All except Jeremy. He just stared at her. And she thought, oh, he probably doesn't get this, and I need to call his parents to explain what it is that I'm, we're doing. However, she went home that night and had a sink that was stopped up and some other things, and she totally forgot. Okay, so the next morning, 19 kids come running in, and they've had their plastic eggs, and they put it in the wicker basket. And so after math class lesson, they're going to open the eggs before recess. So she opens, takes the first egg and opens it up, and there's a little flower. And she goes, oh, yeah, flowers represent new life for sure. She opens up another one. There's a butterfly. And, and the little boy, uh, Tommy, says, that's mine. And she goes, that's great, because new life is that butterfly. And then she opens up another one, and there was moss. And Billy said, oh, that's mine. My dad helped me. And she goes, that's new life, too. Very good. She picks up another egg, opens it up. It's empty. And she thinks, uh-oh, that's I didn't call Jeremy's parents, and he didn't know how to do this. And so she doesn't want to embarrass him, so she sets it aside. And Jeremy looks at her and said, Mrs. Thompson, aren't you going to talk about my egg? And she goes, yeah, but it's empty. And he goes, well, Jesus' tomb was empty. And she couldn't speak. When she finally got the word, she said, do you know why, um, do you know why the tomb was empty? And Jeremy says, oh, yes, Jesus was killed and put in there. And his father raised him up and took him out. The recess bell rang. The kids all ran out. And Doris Thompson started to cry. The cold inside of her melted away. Three months later, Jeremy died. And those that came to pay their respects were surprised to see on his casket 19 plastic eggs, all of them empty. 
Easter is a time for us to remember. The main message of Easter is we all have loss, we all have darkness, and there's always a cycle back to new life. Every one of us experiences our own Easter. The idea is, the truth is, the message is, the dawn always comes, the light always returns. We'll get through the darkness and the death and the loss. We're always given new beginnings. Nothing stays dark forever. Everything is born again, comes around, and there's a new dawn and a new day. And so it is.